right. So no, thank you, Leif. And I'm, it's always tough to uh, to be at the very end of, of a long day for all of you, which is the beginning of the day for me. Um, but I'm happy to um, speak about our work in uh, directing grading of thermosetting polymers. And there's a lot of videos, so hopefully that'll keep everyone interested uh, to the end. And and I'll try try not to go go trying to keep in time, I plan for 25 minutes. So I'll see if I can go a little faster than that. Um, I'm from uh, the Department of Material Science and the Beckman Institute at the University of Illinois. And at Illinois, I have the pleasure of working with two amazing collaborators. Uh, who I show on this slide, Jeff Moore, who's in the chemistry department and Philippe Goubel, who's in aerospace engineering. And, um, they are an intimate part of the work that I'm going to to present uh, this afternoon or this afternoon for for you all. Uh, and then on the top here, I show the uh, graduate students and postdocs who have helped out or, or touched with this work. In particular, I'm going to focus on the work of Gia N. Aw, who is about to receive her PhD, and Leon Dean, who recently uh, graduated now at 3M. Uh, I also should acknowledge that our research is sponsored by the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, as well as the National Science Foundation in the US. So a outline of how my talk is uh, going to go uh, is one, I'm gonna give some background on a technique that we are using to accomplish the polymerization called frontal polymerization. Then I'll talk about the use of frontal polymerization in direct ink writing to get this self-regulating direct ink write, which I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. And then just talk about the, the results, some printed polymers and composites that we're able to fabricate. So starting with frontal polymerization, just give a little bit of background on it for those that aren't familiar with it. Um, the uh, idea behind frontal polymerization is that you have a monomer and a uh, thermally latent uh, initiator uh, all mixed together. So everything is, is there, but it's, it's stable until a heat source comes along. And you only need a heat source, or uh, you could use light, uh, just a small amount of energy to induce polymerization. So you add uh, energy. Uh, it kicks off a uh, exothermic reaction in the monomer. Uh, it basically it triggers the latent initiator. Then that heat diffuses forward um, and then creates the, the surrounding, uh, causes the uh, surrounding uh, monomer to polymerize, generating more exothermic heat. And then finally, what you get is a nice controlled reaction wave or uh, cure front set up in the material. Uh, there are many monomers that are known to frontally polymerize, uh, and I, I, a good review article here is the one by John Poyman uh, that I just cite at the bottom. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the advances our team has made to frontal polymerization as we move through. But let me show you what this looks like in a test tube. Um, a lot of frontal polymerization work goes on in test tubes, but this is the monomer. Uh, it actually, you're going to see it change color as it polymerizes as well. And what you don't see here is a small soldering iron coming in. That's the heat source. Uh, basically, the heat source is taken away very quickly. And you see this uh, nice, smooth front propagate. Hopefully, it's propagating smoothly uh, over the internet. And you get this nice cure front of conversion of monomer to polymer. Um, if you look at this with uh, under IR video, I apologize. These two videos are not on the same exact scale. But you can see the initial heat uh, and exotherm that initiates the reaction. And then you see this reaction wave moving uh, at, at a fairly steady velocity down the test tube as, as we get monomer to polymer. And so you get a sense of the heat that's released uh, in this system uh, as well. So just to kind of to summarize about thermal, uh, about frontal polymerization, it is a reaction thermal transport system. Uh, you see the snapshots of the polymerization in the test tube on the top. And on the bottom here, I show the, uh, really the coupled governing equations uh, there. It's a nonlinear system that 
that control this frontal polymerization process. Here, T is temperature, um, and it, it depends on the thermal properties of the material. Uh, and also, let me, the schematic over on the right just kind of shows you what's going on, that there is monomer converting to polymer, generating heat because of the reaction, and that's governed by uh, HR, which is a property of the monomer. And some of that uh, heat reaction goes back into polymerizing more by diffusing forward. And of course, some is lost to the surroundings. And of course, uh, as this is a controlled process because you're losing monomer, monomer is being consumed as you go through uh, the, the whole thing. Uh, heat is, is moved forward by transport. So you need the um, uh, conductivity, the density, the specific heat of the material. And then alpha here is the degree of cure which basically goes from zero to one and uh, depends on the, the cure kinetic relationship for, for a given polymer, which would be just uh, I, I expressed here as a function of alpha, but it also depends on the activation energy, which is another important property of your monomer. So that's what's governing all of this. Um, our group has been focusing on something uh, known as frontal ring opening metathesis polymerization of a monomer called dicyclopenadiene. The DCPD monomer is well known to our group at Illinois because it, it, we used it many, many years ago uh, in our first work on self-healing. It's really uh, an amazing polymer that forms uh, in the presence of a catalyst, and we're using uh, second generation Grubbs catalyst. Uh, this material forms a, uh, a very tough thermal setting material. And the formulation that we're using is shown here, it's got uh, dicyclopenadiene, we add a small amount of uh, ethylidine norbornine, uh, ENB for short, and then kind of a big, uh, I'll say a little bit more about this on the next slide, we add these inhibitors, which give us uh, a fair amount of pot life and, and flexibility that lets us get out of the test tube and do things like 3D print. Um, on the right-hand side, I just showed the mechanical properties of uh, poly-DCPD, which is, again, a, a thermoset. It's got uh, a TG of about 160 degrees, which can be pushed up to about 210C with, with different uh, co-monomers to increase the cross-linking. It's got an elastic modulus of 2 GPA. It's, it's fairly tough uh, for a thermosetting uh, um, uh, resin, and then it's got a, a well-defined yield. And you can see its mechanical properties here compared against uh, a typical aerospace grade epoxy, which is cured in, a, um, in an oven under you know, much longer conditions, held at temp high temperatures and uh, for long times in the autoclave or, uh, or oven. Uh, and this, of course, our, our materials is polymerized quite, quite rapidly. All right, so a little bit more about the inhibitors. This is really what enables uh, all of what I'm going to show today. We, we uh, reported on these, uh, the use of a, a phosphide inhibitor, which is added to the, the resin formulation and gives us basically a lot of working time and, and quite a bit of control over the rheology of the DCPD monomer. And basically, I show what happens here. Um, both the rheology, you have the loss and storage modules down at the bottom. Also, I have the residual heat of polymerization from DSC experiments. Um, but as this, uh, with this inhibitor, we can have very long, up to 30 plus hours of, of working time uh, before a background uh, reaction takes over. So we can basically have 30 hours before we need to frontally polymerize it, which it gives it time to print or get in a mold. What's interesting though, and this was a bit surprising with use of these inhibitors, is that we were able to see this kind of clear um, gel point at, at room temperature. Um, basically, let me animate that, the gel points here at the crossover of G prime and G double prime. Prior to this, the, the monomer is in a liquid state. At the gel point, it's got a degree of cure of about 0 0.1, and it, it really becomes a gelated material, which is very useful for printing. And then the idea is that we frontally polymerize either from the liquid or the gel state to create our thermostat. So there's these three regimes where when you're when you only have a small incubation time, you can work with it as a li liquid, you can do things like resin infusion, you can certainly extend out this gel point too. I'm just showing one specific example for one concentration of inhibitor. But 
And that allows us to make composites, and composites are the subject of a different talk. Um, then uh, if we let it gel, that lets us get into the range of 3D printing. And then if you exceed the pot life, you don't get front uh, any uh, frontal polymerization and, and really just have a background reaction and, and a material that doesn't have the properties that I showed previously. Right, so let me tell you a little bit how writing, um, uh, printing, 3D printing works with uh, this particular uh, monomeric ink uh, and how we use frontal polymerization in combination with the direct ink write. Uh, this is just a schematic. Uh, basically, we work in general from a, a, a gel form. Uh, we let it incubate and get to the right rheological properties and then put it in a chilled print head. It's pushed out uh, with pressure. Um, and we are able to control a, a print head. And the, we print, uh, right now, the way we do this is we print on a heated bed that triggers a front, and that front moves along as we're printing. So we're curing as we're, as we're printing. Um, just a little bit about the rheological requirements for the ink uh, in, in our setup. You know, we are press, it's a, a pressure driven extrusion. So the ink has to be shear thinning, it needs to be able to flow out through the nozzle. Uh, so we basically control the rheology with the, uh, the chemistry that we have to create a shear thinning material. I show it at two temperatures here because the barrel is at minus five and the ambient temperature is about 20 C. So you can see clearly the, the, the shear thinning response and probably the ink is usually a bit warmer than 20 C. Um, another important thing is that after it comes out, it has to, we don't really want any um, sagging before it polymerizes and so we need just some moderate relaxation uh, it does have to have a this really is a yield stress uh, uh, fluid and then for some of the printing that I, i'm going to show you you need high extensional strains uh, and uh, because we have fairly high molecular weights in this gel we do get really nice extensional strains and you'll see that enables some some freeform printing just to show you what the, the cure front uh, initiation process looks like. Again, I'm gonna show you an IR image and uh, we're gonna start out on the heated stage. Uh, this is the nozzle um, and the heat from the stage is what initiates the frontal polymerization. You'll see the front is um, extruded. Let me get this video started. And then you'll see the reaction trigger. You'll see the exotherm really clearly. And then you can see it just continues polymerizing as we move off of a stage as well. Uh, so let me just, just show you uh, again a little bit just about the printing mechanisms without, any, without printing anything in particular. But I'll show this video where um, basically we were traced along the, the printed bed to initiate it. Polymerization has been initiated, and this is becoming, you know, a solid, fully um, uh, cured thermoset. If you look over here, you can see there's a small amount of uncured resin, uh, and the front is very nicely following and tracking uh, the, the print head, even for really long distances, we can make these cantilevers, right? And actually, it turns out these cantilevers have great dimensional stability. We can actually print things up to 100 millimeters in uh, length with very small deflections because it is a fairly stiff uh, filament after it, it's been finally polymerized with nice fidelity. It's a, it's a nice round cross section. And here I just kind of show a classic printing uh, uh, between two supports. There's, there's really no deflection. Uh, there's no chance for this to slump because it is polymerizing on the fly. So we can get really spans with really high aspect ratios that aren't typical of most direct, direct ink write processes. Let me say a little bit more about how the front is following the print head. This is one of the kind of the interesting things about this process. We call it a self-regulating front speed, yet there's no sensors or, or anything like that that's controlling the front. This is all just a feedback mechanism from the, the, the physics of the process. And so let me just describe the key parameters here. Again, this is an IR image. We call the temperature of the gel right behind the front T gel. Because, um, and, and of course, in, in, in after the front, it's, it's polymerizing and, of course, very, very hot. Um, the velocity of the front, we call V front. The, uh, 
velocity of the print head is what, <clears throat> what you typically control when that's called V print, and this uh, distance of uncured material where it's just gel that's about to, to become polymerized, we were calling that L. Right. And if we look at uh, just some controlled experiments of, of single filaments, like I was just showing before, but if I set the print speed fairly slow, in this case, 1.2 millimeters per second, that is less than the front speed at ambient temperature. And you can see that basically, as you start out here, the front is moving faster than the print head. Um, but because the as the front moves in, it runs into colder material. It actually self-regulates itself back down to the to the front speed. Likewise, if I go faster, if I increase the print speed, which is which is say to 2.6 millimeters per second in this case, that is greater than the front speed at this temperature. And what you see in the top plot is the velocity um, of the front will continue to meet and e equilibrate or, or regulate to the, the print speed, right? And I, I likewise, I show what's going on here with the, this, the length of this uncured spar L also hits and it, it equilibrates as well as the temperature of the gel. And the reason that we can get this kind of self-regulating response is because the front speed itself depends on the temperature of the gel. And so if the, um, uh, let me show this in a, in a way of, it's, it monotonically increases with gel temperature. And you can kind of think we've, we've modeled this as somewhat of a, as a, a feedback loop with the help of the Gubel group. But basically, if we control the print speed and they're initially the, the front speed and the print speed aren't equal, what happens is that the print speed sets up a certain length L of uncured material. Uh, there's a certain temperature of the gel that depends on all of the boundary conditions. Uh, and then, but this front speed is a function of this temperature of the gel. And it, it kind of goes into this cycle where the front speed will automatically adjust to the, 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 the print speed within a range of values. Obviously, if you go too fast and L gets too large, you would have, you would have difficulties. Going too slow isn't too problematic. Um, Using this type of model too, it's interesting. We can actually predict the responses that we measure experimentally, and that predictive tool actually turns out to be quite useful. Um, you can also see this illustrated in a, a different way that there's this inherent coupling of the front. If I if I choose a variable print speed, which is shown in the dark line in the top, then you can see the front speed that follows behind it. It, it really does follow it. The front senses and adapts to whatever the printing nozzle is doing, as does the length, this length of the uncured region and the temperature of the gel. All right, and we can predict this type of, uh, of regulating uh, feedback loop uh, response as well. All right, so let me let me quickly finish up with with the types of things that we can print. Um, and I'll just show you uh, a, an example of some freeform printing. Let me get the video started. Uh, this has hit the heated print bed. And you can see as this uh, goes through a, this spiral pattern, you can see very carefully the, uh, hopefully it's coming through okay with good resolution. You can see the front tracking along with the, um, with the print head. That's an example of this self-regulating response, as I said before. Uh, you can see that this gel has really nice extensional properties because we're able to, to freeform print in this helix. And what you'll see at the end of this video is that this material is a fully cured thermoset. So we're able to uh, make a lot of different parts, uh, you know, just so some different spirals here. We printed a DCPD molecule just for fun, which is the monomeric uh, building block. Uh, we can do overhanging structures, as you saw in the beginning. And what we were doing with this is that we have a lot of we have very high print fidelity to the to the pre-programmed print path that we choose. Uh, so we can do these spirals. Uh, we can even do these uh, these corners by changing by the variable print speed and the fact that the front is is slowing and speeding up as we change the print speed. We can print these things like a star. Um, and then we can also do these combinations of things. I haven't showed you a lot of layer by layer. I'm going to show you that in, in a moment. 
um, where we have this combination of free form, which form these little spider legs, and, and layer by layer to form the, the spider body. All right, so, and the last thing that uh, that we've been working, or not the last thing we're working on, uh, an additional thing that we've been working on to the to looking at towards the um, printing of uh, composites that contain nanoparticles. The nanoparticles also um, are very helpful for printing because they form a translate, transient percolating network. And so the, the process works the same. It also lets us introduce different co-monomers with which also let us tailor properties. And so with this uh, direct engrating with the silica nanoparticle inks that also frontally polymerize, the nanoparticles um, give us the ability to tune the nanoparticle volume fraction, which of course controls the shear rheology. And we do have to get into with, with increasing concentration of nanoparticles. And, and here for today, I'm just talking about silica fume silica nanoparticles, um, we can tune the yield stress and really affect the, the, the shear thinning response of this material. And we can really tune this. I showed an example of a, a quick example of layer by layer with the neat polymer, but with, with the nanoparticles, we really can get excellent uh, layer by layer structuring. Um, and then we also have this ability to tune the degree of cure that basically let this gel a little bit and that gives us varying amount of extensional rheology so we can do these freeform printing with our nanoparticle inks as well. Because as you might imagine, as we add nanoparticles, we lose some of the extensional strain. Let me show you an example of layer by layer printing with a silica DCPD ink. And this is a case where it's not polymerizing on the fly. So we're just direct ink writing with the nanoparticle gel. And it has its rheology has been tuned so that it can be self supporting um, uh, uh, on its own. And then we're going to frontally polymerize it after the fact in this case, just to show you that that, that is possible as well. What's beneficial about that is that basically the, the layers fully cure together uh, really nicely. This is not the most elegant way to do this, but I'll just show you there's the soldering iron and it's going to frontally polymerize. And, and again, you see it requires so little heat to activate uh, this process and get it going. And we can um, make layer by layer prints of, of, of various geometries and shapes. And, and we've been working on studying the capabilities of these nanoparticle inks. We've also been looking at ways to tailor the mechanical properties of these systems. Uh, the DCPD, as I showed you, has high modulus, high TG. We've been adding in co-monomers uh, that have more rubbery elements, and that allows us to tune uh, our ink with, with, by varying the concentration. Here we introduce a co-monomer. This is cyclooctadiene. Um, actually, this is cured by itself. It makes a rubbery polybutadiene. Um, and basically you can, here we're just showing uh, printing of, of small dog bone coupons. The dog bone coupons after frontal polymerization are really beautiful. They just look like regular dog bones, almost molded dog bones. And we can get this range in properties um, from the DCPD material all the way to a, a, a much more rubbery lower modulus material. And we believe we can kind of tune these things on the fly um, as we introduce um, mixing on the fly of the co-monomers, a couple of interesting things going on. And this, this plot just shows for a given concentration of nanoparticles, how we can change the modulus, the strength, the strain to failure, and the glass transition temperature of our, of our frontally polymerized material just by changing the co-monomer fraction by adding this rubbery material. So uh, with, with that, I'll, I'll summarize that hopefully uh, introduce you to a new tool, um, frontal polymerization for direct ink write of thermosetting polymers and composites. Um, we've shown uh, this self-regulating control of the front speed enables freeform 3D printing of complex features uh, with large unsu uh, unsupported uh, aspect ratios. And uh, the shear rheology can be controlled with through, through gelation or through nanoparticles. And it enables layer by layer printing, and you can have combinations of layer by layer and free form printing. Um, and the uh, ink composition 
can be modified on the fly to tune the mechanical, thermal, and electrical properties of these printed nanocomposites. I didn't show you some of the, you know, obviously we can use conductive fillers in these as well, um, but it, it, they function much like the, the silicon nanoparticles that I was able to show. So that, I'll show you the uh, entire group, undergrads included here, and uh, a little bit of what uh, University of Illinois and the Beckman Institute looks like right now in the fall. And take any questions. <laughs>